A quick note before I start the lesson. The last two lines of our second reading talk about the equality of those who have and those who have not. The actual phrasing of the line is, whoever had much did not have more, and whoever had little did not have less. John Locke, who was an economics theorist, and it was upon his theories that the Declaration of Independence was formed. He described a state of nature as one of equality, wherein all the power and jurisdiction is reciprocal. No one has more than another, there being nothing more evident than that the creature of the same species and rank all have the same advantages of nature. And whenever a deal or a process is changed, all people remain equal. No one is made better and no one is made any worse. That is a phrase called the common good. I encourage you greatly to read or hear about John Locke. The last name is L-O-C-K-E, as in Edward, because it is very easy to hear, it is very easy to read. But that is the foundation of our country and is the basis of all of our economic decisions. And it's the Democrats versus the Republicans. You can read it right there. And it's been going on for over 200 years. Okay? Our lesson today is titled, On the Healings of Jesus Christ. The healing of the woman by her faith, who simply touched the hem of Christ's robe, and the healing to life of the not fully dead girl child, that's how she's originally described in the Bible, is characteristic of Jesus' miracles of healing. In St. Mark's Gospel, we read that Jesus told the woman, by your faith you are, you are healed. And the child was healed by the nature of the faith of her father. The episode also shows the outcome of the healing. Each person healed immediately resumes their normal life, thinking immediately of others and not themselves. This is significant, and it is a sign of true health. The disciples are witnesses of his healing. Jesus, however, does not expect them to be mere spectators. He instead invites them to share in his mission. He gives them the power to heal the sick and to cast out demons before he goes to his death. They are given that power in the last 18 months of his life. But that is not something that he decided to do. That was something that he did because the Father required it. This shows that caring for the sick is not an optional activity for the church, but an integral part of her mission. Like Jesus, the church is called to bring the tenderness of God to suffering humanity. The church's commitment to caring for the sick, this essential mission of the church, is particularly relevant today when the world is living through the experience of this ongoing challenges of the coronavirus. Once more, the words of Job speak to our human condition, so high in dignity and at the same time so fragile. And again, we hear the wisdom, the Book of Wisdom call out, the devil's own brought death into the world and it's his forces that keep it here. Jesus does not give an explanation that answers the question of suffering. Instead, he responds with a presence of love that bows down, takes the one who is suffering by the hand, and lifts them up, just as he did with the woman who was bleeding, 
and the not yet fully dead girl child. The Son of God does not manifest his lordship from the top down or from a distance, but in closeness, in tenderness, and in compassion. The scriptures remind us that Jesus' compassion for the suffering is rooted in his intimate relationship with the Father. In the Gospels, Jesus rises very early before dawn and goes to a deserted place to pray. It is from prayer that Jesus drew his strength to accomplish his ministry, preaching, and his healing. You too can draw your strengths from your prayers.